Hi, friends. I'm Jeffrey Phillips, Associate Pastor of Winnetka Congregational Church. We welcome you to this interview with Dr. Elmer Lewis. I'll be introducing Elmer in just a moment. Our church is passionately committed to a number of social issues, and the faith, faith and environment, the intersection of faith and environment, is one of those. And the other is LGBTQ plus equality, interfaith issues, and anti-racism. If you're watching this uh, event on a recording, then uh, you should know that the date is April 19th, 2022. Elmer will be our speaker in person on May 1st, on Sunday, at Winnetka Congregational Church, 725 Pine Street in Winnetka, Illinois, from 8.30 to 9.45 a.m. Central Daylight Time. We invite you, if you find this interview compelling, to join us in person on May 1st to meet Elmer, but also, if you'd like, uh, you can join us on Zoom for that uh, event on May 1st. And to get the Zoom link, please contact me at the church. And my email is jeffrey.phillips at winnetkacongregationalchurch.org. This uh, interview is part of a four-part series on the environment and faith. And we will be having the four Sundays on April 24th, May 1st, May 8th, and May 15th. And we invite you to join us for any or all in that series. You can also find all the recordings for those series on our church's YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and uh, search for Winnetka Congregational Church. And now let me introduce you to Dr. Elmer Lewis, who will be talking to us today about uh, renewable energy and how we can uh, move toward renewable energy, especially with a mix of other kinds of energies that address the very vexing issue of intermittency. I have learned so much by already talking to Elmer and also looking at his slides. And I think you're going to enjoy uh, seeing the issue of energy from uh, a brand new perspective today. Dr. Elmer Lewis is Professor Emeritus and a former chairman of Northwestern's Department of Mechanical Engineering. In descending order of importance, he met his wife, Anne, and obtained a BS, MS, and PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. The following four years were spent on the East Coast, first in the Army, where he achieved the rank of Captain, and then as Ford Foundation Assistant Professor of Nuclear Energy, sorry, Nuclear Engineering at MIT. Elmer joined Northwestern's faculty in 1968 and has remained there through his entire career. He has also served as a visiting professor at the University of Stuttgart and as a consultant at, uh, to Argonne, Los Alamos, and Oak Ridge National Laboratories, and to a number of industrial firms. Elmer's research is focused on the physics and safety of nuclear systems and on technological risks in society more generally. Among numerous technical publications, he's also authored four texts and two trade books. Cast into the limelight at the time of the Fukushima disaster, Elmer appeared on a half dozen different TV channels and did numerous radio and print media interviews. Elmer has spent the pandemic bringing himself up to speed on renewable energy and has given a three hour Zoom mini course, Fighting Climate Change with Sun, Wind, Water, and Nuclear Energy, co-sponsored by the Evanston Public Library and the Northwestern Emeriti Organization. Elmer and his wife, Anne, divide their time between Evanston and their cottage near Gills Rock, Wisconsin. They have two married children and two grandsons. Welcome, Elmer. We are so grateful uh, for your presence and what you're going to share with us today. Uh, can you also add a word about how you know us through somebody named Chuck Dowding? <laughs> oh, oh, surely. In fact, um, the mini course that you mentioned, uh, Chuck attended, and he's also a long-term colleague, colleague of mine. His office was right down the hall from where I was at Northwestern for years, uh, and of course, a par parishioner of yours. So Chuck came to me and he said, hey, that talk would be an interesting topic for a study group at our church. And he's and I said, really? He says, 
and you'd have 40 minutes to do it in. So I'm trying to condense a three hour mini course into uh, 40 minutes. So that's when all of us came up with this idea of me presenting a bunch of slides with background information today, because otherwise there'd be no time for questions or discussions right. if I had to gallop through it all in a 40 minute right. uh, session. And right. that so on, on Sunday, it will be more of your questions discussion. And I'll bring along the slides in case anybody wants to refer back to stuff that was said. And, and, that. Okay. and again, that's, su that's Sunday, May 1st. And it's 8.30 to 9.45 Central Time, in person or on Zoom. So we're looking forward to that. And thank you for, for spending two hours with us, one for this interview and one in person on May 1st. It's my pleasure. What do you have for us today, friend? Basically, what we'll be talking about is how we decarbonize electric production in, in the U.S. Um, and to do that... I first have to figure out how to flip slides there. Okay, now I can do that. So here I have the major players in, in the decarbonization effort. Uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, I found a slide with both windmills and solar panels on it. So that takes care of uh, those. And then the dam on the right-hand side is hydroelectric power, of course. All of these are considered renewable in the broader sense in that you don't have to mine something that you might run out of eventually because uh, as long as the sun shines and the wind blows and the rain falls, uh, they'll always be cool for these resources. The fourth one is nuclear energy, uh, which is not a fossil fuel. It comes from uranium, which is most of the earth is made up with. So the supplies of, of uh, fuel for nuclear energy are actually much greater than they are for fossil fuels, which are more limited in, in their extent. Okay. As things now stand worldwide, if we look at the carbon-free sources of energy, uh, hydroelectric actually plays the largest part. It's about 45% of them. Some places like Norway get all of their electricity from hydroelectric power. Uh, the nuclear comes in second with about 30%, and then wind is down around 15 and solar about five, and then a, there are a few other minor players. We won't say much about hydroelectric power because uh, basically while it has lots of nice and interesting properties, basically all the good get dam sites, particularly in the US are gone. So there's not much opportunity to, to, opportunity to expand its uh, part in the whole thing. The other two have challenges, each of them, and I'll say up front that I think both are needed. Uh, my background is primarily, as you could tell from my introduction and in things, nuclear, but I've spent a lot of time bringing myself up to date on the other. And of course, like everyone else, I have biases, but what I, I, this is my best attempt at at presenting an even-handed picture. Uh, the data that you'll see all comes from government reports, World Health Organization, and that sort of thing, rather than trade magazines and so on that, that have a particular ax to grind and, and who gets the contract to build the next plant and, and so on that way. Okay, so moving on to the US, uh, the next question thing I wanted to look at is where we stand now and where are greenhouse gases coming from? And you'll see here that a little over a quarter of them come from electricity, which is primarily what we'll be talking about. However, uh, if we are really serious about converting to electric cars and trucks and so on that way, a great part of the transportation too then will depend on electricity and smaller parts of the other parts can also be electrified. So we're talking about what in principle, well over half of the greenhouse gases could be eliminated if we could eliminate them from electricity production. The industry is the hardest one to crack because most of the 
greenhouse gas it produces is due to very high temperature heat and making steel and concrete and that sort of thing. However, some advanced reactors now well under development produce heat and then convert it to electricity at temperatures that that, that also becomes a possibility of eliminating greenhouse gases from much of the industrial sector as well. As things stand in the US right now, you can see that coal is still the largest uh, producer of electricity with, with natural gas having come up very fast since fracking brought down its cost. Uh, nuclear is about 20%, hydroelectric, uh, not much in the US. Uh, we're too flat and don't, we don't have the proper topology to uh, really make a large fraction of it. And then uh, renewable energy, uh, that, in, that includes both uh, wind and, and solar energy. Now, what tends to be happening is the, is the nuclear is staying fairly stable. And while renewables are a small fraction here, they're growing very rapidly. And it's interesting, if, if you look at the media coverage of what's going on, you'll, you'll see two things that appear very frequently. And that is first, the number of gigawatts of power produced by renewable sources is growing very rapidly. And when they're cared, compared to the gigawatts of power produced by nuclear plants, it looks very good. However, Oh, and the second thing is that the cost of, um, of renewable energy generation is coming down very rapidly. Now, both of these are true statements as reported in the media, but there's a great deal of context that they really don't have the meaning that you would think they would. And so I'm gonna be spending a fair amount of time going into this very controversial topic of uh, how we should look at uh, renewable energy. Okay, the first thing is, is that when you see in the media that so many gigawatts of electricity are produced by a new wind farm or a, or a new solar farm, they always are talking about gigawatts capacity, which is a technical term. But what that really means is that's how much electricity it can produce under the most ideal conditions. So for example, if you have a gigawatt solar farm, that means on a sun, summer, sol, summer solstice day with no clouds at noon, that's how much electricity. But a much more meaningful measurement is how much electricity it can produce over the course of a year. In other words, what's the average number of gigawatts if you average over a year? And there uh, the com you get a much different comparison because for example, uh, with wind energy, it's only about a third. And so in other words, to get a gigawatt average over a year, you really need three gigawatts of wind farms and Solar is actually worse because at least the wind blows at night and the sun doesn't shine. And so solar, it's only about a fourth. So in order to get a gigawatt average over a year, you have to have three gigawatts of wind or four gigawatts. Nuclear, on the other hand, plants run seven days a week, 24 hours a day. They shut down once every 18 to 24 months for a little less than a month for refueling, and that's it. So to get um, one gigawatt from a nuclear plant on an average, you need a plant that's oh, maybe 105 gigawatts. Or, I mean, not one, not 105, I mean 1.05 gigawatts, okay. I think on the next slide, I've sort of summarized that. So what we're seeing are numbers usually for peak power when you hear them quoted. And so to get one gigawatt of power uh, averaged over a year, you would need three gigawatts of wind, four gigawatts of, of solar, or just one gigawatt. Uh, the other aspect of 
renewable energy is the question of land use. And we that's probably a good discussion to come back to because we don't have time. But you can see that uh, if you look at wind in particular, whereas a one gigawatt reactor takes about a square mile, a one gigawatt wind farm takes about 280 square miles. That's a little bit larger than the entire area of the city of Chicago, just to give you an idea of comparison there. Um, and the nuclear plant's also low, last longer. Okay. Um, okay, let me go back to that for a minute. Okay, but the situation is even more complicated than that because uh, electricity cannot be stored. Um, except in very small amounts in, t in terms of the amounts we're talking about here. And we can argue about that. That's another good uh, discussion question for uh, Sunday, if, if someone would like to uh, br uh, bring it up. And so what happens is you have to produce electricity at the time it is needed, down to the second. And so what we next look at is a, an electricity demand curve. Uh, so what this is, is these curves are electricity demand and a fraction of an, an, annual peak power, if you like. And this is for one week. And you notice the, the peaks are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, because they're for three different seasons. There are three curves for summer, winter, and the other one is for spring and fall is pretty similar to spring. And, so, and normally what you have then is on a daily basis, the power needs go up and they peak around three or four in the afternoon and then go down and have their minimum around four o'clock in the morning. And that's more or less universally true. Um, in a temperate area or warmer area, the summer peaks are the biggest because of air conditioner use is what drives them up. The winter peaks here are quite a bit smaller, uh, but they are more than spring or fall because of the increased use of electricity for both heating and light during the winter. <clears throat> so you, you have these three different situations that you have to worry about the daily variations and also the seasonal variations and always have enough power to meet that demand on a minute by minute basis. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, um, so let's look at solar energy first. And to do that, what I wanna do is take one day's worth. You can't see my hands going back and forth over the screen here, but I wanna take one, one, of those, one of those Peak Valley Hills and spread it out over the whole thing so we can look at what happens uh, when we introduce solar energy. And that's shown here. And the black line above uh, is uh, the demand. And this is what the demand, the total demand is. Now, what these other lines are, are reduced demand. Incidentally, uh, this curve doesn't look much like it, but it's become known as the duck curve because of the general shape of the thing, uh, particularly by Californians. Um, Okay, these other curves are what happens to the demand when you subtract out the amount of solar energy. In other words, the more solar energy you use, the less of everything else you need. And so the rest is called residual demand, the technical term. I'm going to call it backup energy. In other words, if you want to go solar, the backup energy is what else need, you need that have to add together to get this, the total demand. And you see what happens as you increase. This is for 10%, 20%, 30%, uh, I'm sorry, 0, 10, 20, and 30% solar energy. And you can see what happens is the demand for everything else starts going down at sunrise here about 5.30 a.m., is very low through the, the midday hours and then comes back up until the sun goes down and there's no more solar energy. So what you have then is this curve uh, for everything else that you've got to supply with non-solar energy that, that starts out and then it takes a big dip in the midday and it goes back up. Now it's very hard for other plants to follow a curve like that. 
because what it means is they have to shut down and start up very rapidly every 24 hours. And uh, just as your automobile gets much better gas mileage when you're going at a constant speed on an expressway than it does in city, city stop start driving, so is true of energy production plants, whether they be either fossil fuel or nuclear. Uh, in uh, reactors, it's very difficult to bring one up that fast. And in natural gas plants, which are popular now because of their cheap cost, um, it's also difficult to do that. And what happens, in fact, is, is if you try to run them at low power during these dips, the combustion is poor, the efficiency goes down, and the air pollution goes up. So a typical gas plant, the most efficient ones, if you run, many of them are not allowed to run at less than 50% power because the air pollution problem becomes too great. So my main point of it is here, is when you introduce solar energy and the same turns out to be wind, you have this demand for everything else that fluctuates very rapidly. And it's very hard to build efficient, non-polluting, non-renewable plants that can do that. Uh, we have them with reactors. They're in submarines and aircraft carriers and they're very expensive. Uh, and you can also build this sort of plant for natural gas, but they're going to piston engines, which are less efficient and more polluting and so on that way. So there's a real trade-off there. Uh, now this is an ideal case. I'm assuming a sunny day. Uh, and so the curves are nice and smooth. Here's some real data for a summer and a winter day on the solar energy production. Now what this curve is, is how much power is actually coming from solar energy. And you can see it peaks right about noon. And here the sun comes up about 5 a.m. and goes down about uh, eight o'clock at night on a summer day. But there are all these jagged peaks in there. Well, those, those are because clouds are passing through. So anytime you've got a solar system on a partly cloudy day, the, the output's gonna fluctuate very greatly. Once again, the residual power, or whether it's nuclear or fossil fuel or hydroelectric, has to compensate for all those very sharp fluctuations going on. Situations worse in the winter, because you can see the gray curve down here, this, the sun comes up later, goes down earlier, and it's not very bright during the day. Uh, and this particular data, which comes from Belgium, uh, has a lot of cloudy days. And whenever you have totally overcast skies, the solar production goes down to about 20% of what it would be on, its, on a sunny day. So whenever you have an overcast day, you've got to make up all that 80% of that power with something else even if you could do the whole thing with uh, solar energy. Uh, and on top of that, while the production is much lower in the winter than in the summer of solar energy, the demand isn't. In fact, the further north you go, the higher the demand for energy in the winter is because of heating and lighting. And so you have a seasonal mismatch too, in that case, to, to deal with the uh, winter peaks. Okay, to move on, there are lots of details we could go into. Oh, I, and I might say that even in a desert client, a, a climate uh, where it never rains, you still do have overcast days that can last for more than one day at a time. So you still need that backup power to fill in for that. Once again, the standard answer is, oh, we can store the electricity in batteries or something else um, and spread it out to when it's needed. Uh, in my opinion, we aren't anywhere near being able to achieve that even with the rapid uh, increases we've had in the efficiency of batteries and so on. Uh, something else we can come back and talk about in more detail later. Okay. Uh, more briefly for wind energy, we get a somewhat different pattern. And unfortunately I couldn't get graphs that has the, you know, the same colors and 
uh, methodology and so on. In this one, this is once again for a week, and the blue line is once again electrical demand. And you can see it has seven peaks, and those uh, correspond to roughly at noon. This is data from Denmark, and you can see Saturday and Sunday, not many people are working because the electrical demand is quite low on the last two seven days of their Okay, the black line, and this is for 50% wind energy in that climate, is you can see the black line goes up and down someplace. Sometimes there's no wind at all, so you have to provide the backup power totally. At other times, there's more wind than you can use. And in that case, they are forced to shut down the windmills wind turbines, I should call them, or they have to uh, be able to sell the power to some other country or someplace who, who can use it. Okay. Now, um, so, and this one, the residual power or the backup power is the distance between those two curves. And so at sometimes you have to provide the full, full load with non-wind power. At other times, you've got so much wind, uh, you can't use it all. And the more difficult thing even is the rates at which that happen go up and down. In, in other words, over a matter of hours, you can lose all your wind power or it can come up if you have a front go through. And that means that the other plants on the grid have to somehow compensate for that. So this is the real problem of intermittency is how you fit the whole thing together so that electrical demand is exactly met by the generation at any second in time as it, as it goes on. Okay, so what I'd like to do is try to summarize this now and, and look at how much is gained when you can use any of these low carbon, um, low, low carbon methods, whether they be wind, solar, nuclear, or hydro, compared to coal and natural gas. Uh, in much of the world, and particularly in the US, oil has become so expensive that it's just not used to generate electricity anymore. Okay, so what happens? It, the, the important thing is the relative length of these bars, which is uh, basically, how many grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour of electricity is put into the atmosphere. And you can see by this that cold is by far the worst. Natural gas is only half of that just because of the basic combustion of uh, CH4 versus C, which is cold. And if you go through the thermodynamics, uh, you can cut it in half. In fact, many of the gains that were made in the U.S. over the past decade or two have come from the conversion from coal to natural gas because that cuts the amount of carbon you're putting into the atmosphere by about a factor of two. And Elmer, may, Elmer, may I ask real quick, does that include, does that take into account the methane that is uh, put into the atmosphere through leakage and natural gas? You're only two slides ahead of me. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and oh, be before we get to that, let me just mention, you say, well, why does solar and wind and nuclear and hydro also contribute? That's because these are total costs and it takes a lot of steel and concrete to build these things. And you use a lot of fossil fuels and making steel and concrete. So that's wh what those lower numbers are. Okay, but now the question is, if we wanna use, um, if we want our economy to run on say solar or wind, we have to have a backup power. So we've gotta figure that into the total amount of CO2 that's put into the atmosphere. And when you do that, the curves then look like this. So if you're planning to go solar or wind with natural gas as a backup, uh, then you can see that it's still better than using straight natural gas, but not as much. If you could use nuclear as a, or hydro as a backup, and in some places uh, hydro is, then you don't have that, that orange part of the bar. 
Okay, but now the problem is that um, one of the worst greenhouse gases is unburned natural gas or methane. It doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long, but it's like 80 times as powerful as carbon dioxide. Um, the government estimates in the U.S. are somewhere like between 2 and 4 percent of the natural gas winds up going into the atmosphere as methane rather than as burned natural gas. And, and because of that, when you look at the, the gray area, then, is what the, the total carbon dioxide equivalent is when you add in the effects of the natural gas. And you can see that natural gas comes out looking that much, not that much better than coal and solar and wind. Uh, well, it points out that how important it is that we get rid of those natural gas leaks or at least get them down to much smaller than they are at present if, if we want to do that. Okay. okay. Uh, I was going to set my watch to see how many minutes I, and I was, and of course, yeah. I didn't pay any attention to it. No worries. Uh, we've been on about 30 minutes for your presentation. Okay. I, I think I can uh, make it through. Okay. The other, we've talked a lot about the intermittency. The other thing is the cost. And, uh, and let me just skip over this one and go directly to the cost. And once again, uh, we have to talk about total cost. If we want to go to say using all wind or all solar or something like that, this is the total cost of electricity, say in dollars per, I forget what the unit, dollars per megawatt it would be. And um, there are two, things. The direct cost, which is in the blue, that's the cost of building and operating the plants, okay? And that has been coming down very sharply for both wind and solar energy. However, the, the grid cost or system cost really then are a couple of things. One is how much do you need in the, of new transmission lines to put the thing into place? And that, that's a fairly small piece of all of these. But the two huge things then for both wind and solar are that backup uh, energy. Because if you're going to run those, you've got to have the backup energy. Uh, and so you to figure the total cost to society what the investors, the, the rate payers, or the government subsidies are going to have to pay has to all add up to um, what those are, are costing. See, and there are a couple of smaller points that could be made about that as well, but I, I think we'll leave that for the moment and um, go on to our next major topic. And that is, well, so far, nuclear energy is looking pretty good on some of these things. Not bad from a cost basis, and uh, it doesn't emit any greenhouse gases, and it can run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, only shutting down once every couple of years. However, um, it's the safety of the things and the public perceptions of that that are the big problem. Well, it's a problem. A topic that's of been interest to me, and I finally wound up writing a book on it in my retirement on uh, technological risk, real and perceived. And there, this the book isn't just about nuclear, uh, all sorts of things. I mean, airline travel is much safer than automobiles, but yet people are afraid of flying and so on that way. But the the, the gap between what the statistician looks at, the risk assessor, the person who counts bodies and looks at numbers of accidents and that sort of thing, and the general public is probably widest with regard to nuclear energy and, radi and particularly radiation uh, than on any other. And why is that so? Well, whoops, I'm going the wrong direction. Oh no. In fact, if we, if we look at the statistics, the, you can see that this is d deaths per unit of electrical energy. A terawatt hour is a lot of energy. That's a trillion watt hours of energy. But if we look at these, uh, the fossil fuels come out 
pretty badly, a soft coal worse than hard coal and so on. Most of that is due to air pollution uh, that that comes from. And the, in the case of gas, uh, there's less air pollution, but there are more chances that we have gas line explosions every once in a while and they tend to kill people and also workers in the plants. And nuclear is very slow. If, if I could come up with good statistics for wind and solar, um, I assume they're down in the same ballpark as nuclear. You know, it's, it's, it's the occasional accident. It's, it's not something that's a systemic thing. Uh, to give you some idea, uh, they're shutting down nuclear reactors because of fear in Germany. And uh, one of the institutes there made a calculation that they were figuring by shutting down one of their large reactors, they were killing roughly a thousand people a year from air pollution from replacing it with burning brown coal. So, okay, that, that's sort of the way I look at it and the way that people would count bodies and look at accidents and so on, count them, but not the public. And why is that so different? Well, uh, the cloud of Hiroshima still hangs over the nuclear industry. There's no question about it. It's associated with nuclear war and the fear associated with, with all of that. And, and that has really inculcated and permeated the culture. So if we look over the years, uh, we just have multiple incidents from Dr. Strangelow to Homer Simpson and movies like China Syndrome and On the Beach and so on, that even though these are admittedly fiction, it really permeates the public's opinion of the safety of this whole area of, of energy production. And so one of the more recent ones is a movie on uh, the worst accident, which was the Chernobyl uh, accident that uh, took place. And there's a lot of emphasis in the movie on there were 30 people who died of acute radiation poisoning and a hundred or more who became ill and recovered, but these were all occupational workers. Uh, but the movie focuses on that and this dread disease and, and that. When, if you look at really what happened in the Chernobyl uh, accident, it was, it destroyed the reactor. At the time, it was, it was predicted that there would be tens of thousands of deaths from cancer as far as the, the uh, radiation released from it. And uh, people all over the world were worried. I mean, because you could, you could detect even small amounts of radiation even in the US, uh, but certainly in the Scandinavian countries in Europe and, and that way. And yet none of those predictions came true. If we look at it now, uh, there were very few deaths from, from cancer. In fact, they, they're not even detectable in the people who live in the, in the area of the reactor over the normal, normal cancer rate. You, why is this so? Well, in fact, there were the one radiological consequence of that a accident was there were 6,000 cases of thyroid cancer amongst, mainly amongst children. Uh, but if there had been even decent public health measures, that could have completely been prevented. In other words, that resulted from radioiodine being uh, spread on the fields where the cows ate and it concentrated in cow's milk and the children were eating the, the or drinking the cow's milk and got cancer as a result of it. Fortunately, if you've got to have cancer, thyroid cancer is the kind to have because it's very curable if it's caught even in rel at relative early stages. My wife had it and she's still with us 35 years later. Um, and at any rate, so there, there were something like 20 deaths that resulted from this rash of thyroid cancer. But the radioiodine dies away fairly rapidly. It has a so-called, 
it reduces by a factor of two about every eight days. So after a few months, it's gone. It's not a, a long-lived problem. So that was the Chernobyl accident. Then we had a tsunami of biblical proportions where nearly 20,000 people were drowned. But what's it referred to on the media? It's referred to as the nuclear disaster. You know, forget those 20,000 people who drowned. We're, we're only concerned with the ones who may have died as a result of radiation poisoning. And so what's, uh, it was pretty spectacular too. I mean, uh, there were hydrogen explosions, which are not nuclear explosions uh, that sent up clouds of smoke and so on that way. But it turns out, if you look at how many people died, None of the operators died from radiation poisoning. There were three deaths, two of them drowned, and the beam fell on the third. Um, of the general populations, the studies of, there's, there was no thyroid cancer because they had a good public health system and no one was allowed to drink the milk of any of the contaminated areas. Um, but, Elmer, Elmer, excuse me, this is a Fukushima, right? Yeah, didn't I call it that? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think you identified it. But well, to, That's a sore point with me because when I was giving the, the lecture, I mistakenly said Hiroshima for Sh Fukushima. And I thought, oh, my God. Fortunately, there was a chat room and somebody corrected everybody who was listening in on that. Okay, so this time I hope I called it uh, Fukushima. Um, yeah, but at any rate, to, to go on, if you look at the amount of radiation exposure that people got, um, and again, the studies were done by people like the World Health Organization and others that only about 10 people got more radiation than you'd get in a whole body CAT scan uh, from, you know, the cloud going over in that way. So we don't have the cancer deaths there. So the question is, what on earth is going on? You know, we, we predict these horrendous uh, consequences, scare the public to death about it. And it's built into the society's view of, of radiation and how dangerous it is. But it all goes back to the, the fact that when these predictions were made, our, our way of, of judging the effects of radiation were, not, uh, were flawed. We didn't have the science and we were looking at the wrong stuff. Uh, there's a controversy going on that's too technical to go into any detail here about the method was used that was called the linear no threshold method that said no how no matter how small the the exposure was there was still a danger the danger was proportional to the exposure so although you had a probability of one in a thousand of getting a ch uh, cancer if you expose millions and millions of people to it you still got thousands of cancers out of it well that never occurred and we now think we understand why through many epidemiological and biological studies and so on. And that is there is a threshold be below which the body can repair itself from any damage that's done by radiation. And in fact, we all live in an environment that's filled with background radiation. And to uh, demonstrate that point, here's a map of the US where the color uh, indicates the level of background radiation. And it, it's highest in the Rocky Mountain areas and it's quite low in the Gulf states where it's the blue color. And there's a, between the, the average and the highest, there's a factor of like 25 times as much. And in fact, if you look at the background radiation on the Colorado Plateau, it's about three times what the background radiation is in the Gulf Coast. And yet the cancer rates in the Gulf Coast are higher than those on the Colorado Plateau. And it's, this isn't just a single instance. There have been many, many studies. There are other places in the world, like some of the beaches in Brazil in particular, where the background radiation are much, much higher than in the U.S. Uh, there, if I try to do this in, in whole body CAT scans, uh, they're equivalent to about 40 whole body CAT scans a year. And still there, there's no correlation between the number of cancer cases of any kind and uh, the levels of radiation. 
So the point of it is below some level, uh, the body repairs itself and there, there's no indication that, um, that we're causing cancer with these low levels of radiation. And most of the people who were involved in these accidents didn't get above that threshold. And so we're not seeing any increases in the cancer rates in those areas. Again, the radioiodine being the, the one exception because it gets so concentrated in one particular organ of the body that there it does uh, uh, cause a problem. So, so Elmer, we, we, Elmer, we have about uh, 10 minutes, I'd say. Yeah, okay. I think I can get through to the end. <laughs> but, but the real question is then, although there were only... Uh, of the general pop population, 20 or 30 deaths other than imperceptibly low levels of cancer, there were something like 10,000 suicides that resulted from the Chernobyl accident of people who were so just distraught by it that they took their own lives. And the best estimates are there were probably 10 times that many of abortions performed because people thinking if they were pregnant at the time of the accident took place, they'd have deformed children or something else, none of which ever happened. In fact, after the bombings of Hiroshima at Nagasaki, there was a 10 year study done of the survivors who were exposed to radiation and that there was no measurable increase in the number of birth defects or anything else that you might expect from that. So, uh, and the same thing from uh, the Fukushima accident is uh, we're just not seeing the radiation. However, it's the fear itself that's causing the problem. In that case, after Fukushima, there were something like 150,000 people that were evacuated and they were taken out of hospitals and nursing homes and shipped to places that really weren't to keep them away from the radiation. And the net result of the most recent studies is that over a thousand people died as a result of those evacuations where virtually none of them would have died if they had just closed their windows and stayed where they were during the course of the accident. So at danger of making turn it into trivia, I think that uh, Roosevelt's ad adage about the only thing we have to fear, fear itself does have some application to the nuclear area be because in and both in mental health and evacuations and so on, we're doing things that are causing more deaths than the actual accident that we're trying to deal with. Okay, the last thing everybody's interested in is waste. They say, okay, accidents are okay, but what about all that nuclear waste? Well, the first thing to point out is there's very little of it. This is in tons of waste and you can see. Um, and moreover, that the, the the waste uh, is very toxic in terms of particularly coal. Um, if we compare coal to nuclear, nuclear, once a year, you have to exchange out about one-sixth of the fuel in reactors. So that's one-sixth of a reactor core. A, a coal plant of the same of a gigawatt size, same power as a nuclear plant, um, that's my alarm to do something else, not to talk sober. Uh, but, but a nuclear plant, uh, a coal plant of the same size, you um, burn 100 coal cars of coal a day in that plant. About 15% of that is ash. So you've got about 15 car loads, coal car loads of ash a day to dispose of. And that ash is put in wherever you can find room for it. Uh, in Illinois, they used a lot of uh, abandoned uh, pits of various, where various things had been mined. In other places, it's put in slurry lakes. And that ash has in the stench, 
significant percentages of lead, mercury, arsenic, stuff that lives forever. It doesn't have a half-life and die away. So both from toxicity and just the amounts, the uh, amount of nuclear is much less. Moreover, uh, we in the nuclear area don't call it waste. We call it spent fuel. And that spent fuel is actually a resource. If you look at what it's made up of, most of it is unburned uranium. Uh, the actual fission products, that's the stuff with the real high radioactivity, is only three to four percent of what's in there. And that has fairly short lives, half lives. So that part of it is gone in three to four hundred years. If all you had was the fission products, it wouldn't be this hundreds of thousands. Those much longer living radioactive isotopes are an isotopes of plutonium and other transuranic elements, but those can be recycled and burned in reactors, okay? And the, even the uranium has some use in future reactors. So if you separate out the fission products and, and take care of them, the problem is only several hundred years old. And if you recycle the rest of it, you can burn those uh, in the more advanced design reactors. That's pretty well what we have today. <clears throat> okay, so why don't we do that? <clears throat> well, in some places they are. Uh, France recycles, who has 70% of 5% of their electricity from nuclear reactors, recycles their fuel. They separate out the fission products uh, and put them in ceramic logs. They blended into a ceramic logs that are only about 20% of the volume of the fuel that they started with. And, um, and then the, the rest they're recycling in their reactors of the plutonium and the large amount of 238, they're just saving for future use. Um, and with that, even after a few hundred years, the radioactivity in those fission products is less than the radioactivity of the uranium ore from which it came out of the mines originally. So that's the situation. Why don't we do it here as they do it in France? Well, here we get into political science rather than engineering. Is France, we'll have to admit, is a somewhat more socialistic country than we are. And they, their national grid is run by electricity of France, which is a, a monopoly and uh, they make the decisions on what to do with the fuel. In the US, the fuel reprocessing to recycle it and store it would have to be done by private industry and there's no money to be made there. Uh, the reason there's no money to be made is it's cheaper just to mine and buy new uranium than it is to recycle that fuel to recover the uranium and plutonium. So that's sort of the conundrum with, with the waste situation. In the US, the government was supposed to take care of it, uh, but that's run into other uh, political problems as well. Well, I, I could go on a little bit more. Uh, what we're doing instead, storing our waste above ground. And it's it seems to be a manageable problem. Uh, uh, a gigawatt reactor, you'd fill about two of these casks per year, and they uh, are well protected. We can talk about that more later, yeah. but I think I'm probably about out of time. Yeah, we are nearing the end of this time, but uh, whatever we don't cover today, we certainly uh, can address on May 1st when you're going to be with us in person at Winneka Congregational Church. Um, is there, as we conclude our time here, Elmer, is there one or two, maybe three takeaways for general audience in terms of public policy decision points uh, from your presentation? Uh, it, it sounds to me like uh, you've made a very interesting case about the problem, the problems associated with renewables that most of us don't know about. And that's, that's what I found so compelling about your talk this problem of intermittency um, and the, the, the fact that we're going to need other forms of uh, more conventional uh, energy 
production, such as nuclear and maybe even fossil fuels, in order to smooth out that transition in the future. Um, but do you have any particular uh, sort of takeaways for people about public policy in this regard? Well, I, I think that the, the major problem uh, with renewables is this energy, electricity storage, if you like, um, beca because it's really a horrendous problem. And I think that we're hearing all these wonderful things about batteries and so on. And I think the misconception is that they're going to get us to the point where, hey, we just store all this electricity and batteries. The cost of doing that are horrendous even if we could do it. And I think you have to take that into account. If we can find a way to store electricity, we've got to do it in an economical way. And that's where the huge problem comes. It certainly, there are uses right now for energy storage and batteries. For example, smoothing out the, those, those uh, peaks and valleys in that, in that solar curve on partly clouded days. You can, you can store it for short periods of time, very short periods of time to do things like that. So that's the one, that, that the energy storage is the huge unsolved problems for renewables. So, yeah. um, so, something I'm, I've gotten from my conversations with you and today's presentation also with Chuck uh, mm -hmm. is I always thought that we were already at, at a very advanced place in terms of storing uh, energy produced by renewables. But, but you've made it really clear that we are far, far uh, from where we need to be for that to be possible. Yeah. And therefore, we need to think creatively about other, other means, uh, including nuclear, perhaps, to, uh, to, to get to where we want to be. So There's another thing that, that I didn't mention that's cropped up. And the, the dilute nature of renewables and the amount of land area. Uh, the Czech Republic did a study to decide to whether they should go in a big way with wind energy. And they decided, no, they'd have to, it's a densely populated country and they'd have to basically cover the country with windmills. And there, there's a lot of objections to the visual pollution in the cities we don't see it my wife comes from a small farming community downtown where there's a huge wind farm that's gone up uh, her parents are buried in this beautiful little cemetery on a knoll looking over this bucolic scene but now you go there and it's windmills in all directions and uh, there are a lot of people in 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 more populated areas that are that are are really objecting to this by uh, because these things are are not not your old fashioned windmill they're like practically double the height of the Washington Monument and they are they have to be fairly tightly spaced even with those numbers so so the 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 dilute nature is also uh, that's one of the reasons for going to offshore wind. Uh, which is more expensive than, than, than on land because of all the obvious uh, challenges with that. So. Yep. Well, um, let's pick up this conversation, a very fascinating conversation, so much great information that was so new to me and I'm sure other people who are watching. We'll pick it up when you join us in person, uh, May 1st at Winneka Congregational Church, 725 Pine Street. That's Sunday. Uh, we meet from 8.30 to 9.45 a.m. Central Time in person and also on Zoom. And just reach out to me, Jeffrey Phillips, Winneka Congregational Church, jeffrey.phillips at Winneka Congregational Church, if you would like the Zoom link so that you can join in this conversation. Elmer, thank you so much. And thank you, Chuck Dowding, for, <laughs> for bringing Elmer Lewis to us. We are I keep telling Chuck I've got to get him out because his expertise, of course, is in the strength and failure of structures of various sorts. So I, I think you, you need a series where you, you can make him give a talk as well. <laughs> he has before, and they've been uh, as enlightening as this one has. <laughs> okay. So uh, stay on the line here, Elmer, just a moment, and I'm going to say goodbye to people who are watching at home. Be well, and may... You enjoy God's blessings today.